On today's episode, there's a ghost on the moon, Athena prepares for landing, and a gremlin appears in the SpaceX Starship. For the first time in decades, an American-made spacecraft has safely and successfully touched down on the surface of the moon. And as the sun rises over the lunar surface, the Blue Ghost lander's mission is already well underway. Blue Ghost was manufactured by the private company Firefly Aerospace in Cedar Park, Texas. The mission was funded by NASA under their Commercial Lunar Payload Services contract, and it carries with it 10 new scientific payloads that have already begun to study the moon. On March 2nd, Blue Ghost began its final descent down to the lunar surface. This came after a slow, methodical journey from Earth that took more than a month to complete. Blue Ghost lifted off in early January on a Falcon 9 rocket. It spent 25 days in Earth orbit performing systems checks. It spent 4 days traveling to orbit around the moon, where it spent another 16 days slowly zeroing in on the perfect landing spot. Blue Ghost entered its descent phase with a target on the Mare Crisium region, that's northeast on the moon's near side to the Earth. As the lander coasted down to the surface, it used an AI computer vision-based terrain navigation system to determine the lander's position and identify the optimal landing zone. Once the lander begins its powered descent phase, it's operating in a fully autonomous mode. The ground crew put their trust in the lander to do what it's designed to do. Blue Ghost's navigation system is actively tracking craters, slopes, and rocks to select a hazard-free parking spot within the landing zone. And that navigation system performed flawlessly. Firefly has dubbed themselves the first commercial company in history to achieve a fully successful moon landing. They have to be a bit careful with that wording because Intuitive Machines is another private US company that landed on the moon last year. They claimed the title for themselves of first commercial soft landing on the moon, which is true in the sense that they didn't smash into the moon at high velocity like so many have done before, but they still landed hard enough to snap the leg off of their spacecraft, which then ended up flat on its back and kind of failed to complete most of the science that had been intended. Anyway, here's what Blue Ghost is doing on the moon. With a maximum payload capacity to the surface of 150 kilograms, the lander has been loaded out with 10 NASA-funded payloads, my favorite of which being the Moon Vacuum. Lunar Planet Vac is designed to suck up dusty regolith samples from the surface underneath the lander. Another really cool experiment is one that was running as the lander was touching down. This is the stereo cameras for lunar plume surface studies. It's taking photos of the dust that was kicked up by the spacecraft's landing thrusters to measure how much material goes airborne and how it behaves once it's been distributed. Moon dust is very fine, very light, and it moves through an environment with no air and very relatively low gravity. So once it gets into motion, there's not much that is going to slow it down. That could be a very large problem, and we're worried that if we kick up too much dust by operating on the moon, we could trigger some kind of infinite dust storm. Speaking of that dust, Blue Ghost is equipped with a new instrument called the Electrodynamic Dust Shield. It's supposed to prevent buildup on equipment by using electrical currents to repel the dust particles. This technology will be critical if we want to build things like long-term solar panels, windows, or radiators on the moon. It can be very useful for keeping the abrasive dust off of an astronaut's visor as they explore the moon as well, something that was a big problem for the Apollo astronauts. This is the next generation lunar reflector. It's going to help us measure the distance between the Earth and the Moon down to sub-millimeter accuracy. Basically, they're going to use this little mirror to reflect a laser beam down to a receiving station on the Earth. The Lunar Instrument for Subsurface Thermal Exploration with Rapidity is a very long name for a drill that's going to penetrate 2 to 3 meters into the ground to show how heat flows through conductive surfaces below the moon's surface and the thermal changes between depths. And then we have the Lunar Magnotelluric Sounder. 
This is at the top of a mast that extends out from the top of the lander. It's actually going to measure the activity deep within the lunar mantle, as in two-thirds of the way down to the moon's core. And then, after all of that work is done, over the course of 14 Earth days, Blue Ghost will capture images of the lunar sunset, paying particular attention to how the lunar regolith reacts to changes in sunlight, and then the lander will continue to operate for several hours in darkness until its batteries finally go dead. And if that wasn't enough, a second American commercial lander will be taking a shot at landing on the moon this week. Intuitive Machines is back for round two with their new and improved Nova C landing platform. That's the same one from last year with the broken leg, but this time around, Intuitive Machines says that they have made a wide variety of changes to the lander to improve on last year's unfortunate result. The company claims that advancements in both software and hardware will result in 20 times greater landing precision on their second attempt. Intuitive Machines Mission 2 has been named Athena. It lifted off successfully on a SpaceX Falcon 9 last week and is expected to begin descent to the lunar surface on Thursday, March 6. Athena is targeting a landing zone on the moon's South Pole region. Moving on to the payloads, Athena has been equipped with the Trident Drill, which was developed for NASA by Honeybee Robotics. Trident is going to be able to drill down as deep as one meter below the surface by using a rotary percussive method, basically a hammer drill. As the bit is retracted from the ground, it's going to pull up soil cuttings, which will then be analyzed by a mass spectrometer called M-Solo. This spectrometer will detect the chemical makeup of the soil cuttings, looking specifically for certain minerals and signs of water. Athena will also deploy a small rover onto the moon. This is MAP. Developed by Lunar Outpost, it's a four-wheeled vehicle less than two feet in length and height, weighing in between 5 and 10 kilograms, with the ability to carry up to 15 kilograms of payload and move at a speed of 10 centimeters per second. This rover is equipped with a near-field depth camera. It's basically going to create a 3D scan of the lunar surface that can be used to construct a perfectly accurate virtual reality environment of the moon for future astronauts to train in. And riding on the back of the MAP rover will be a secondary micro rover, the Astro Ant. Developed at MIT, Astro Ant is small enough to fit in the palm of your hand and is designed to be used in swarms of multiple rovers that can be used for spacecraft diagnostics and repairs. This single unit test rover will drive around on the back of MAP using magnetic wheels and it will measure the temperature of the radiator from different positions, which will help to monitor the performance of the bigger rover's thermal system. And then there's Micronova, a rocket-powered miniaturized version of the Athena lander created by Intuitive Machines that will function as a hopper vehicle. It's basically a two and a half foot cube with landing gear and a rocket engine. It can carry one kilogram of payload over a distance of more than 2.5 kilometers. Micronova is able to hop up to five times on one mission, and this will allow it to get into locations that would be too risky for the main lander to enter. For example, Intuitive Machines believes that Micronova can be the first vehicle to enter subsurface lava tubes on the moon. We know that Micronova will be hopping into the bottom of permanently shadowed craters, where it's believed that water ice will be found. While in flight, the hopper will use two high-resolution cameras to image the lunar surface. It's also equipped with a spectrometer for measuring subsurface hydrogen, and a radiometer to measure the surface temperature. Both Micronova and the MAP will be communicating with the Athena lander using a mobile 4G LTE communication system, which is provided by Nokia. Yes, they still exist and they're going to the moon. This will be the first time that a non-radio-based communication will be used on the moon, which should enable the command and control of vehicles from the Earth and high-definition video streaming from the lunar surface. Shifting gears here into SpaceX, we had been anticipating another Starship launch this week on Monday evening. The mission was then aborted at T-40 seconds on the countdown clock. At the time, SpaceX didn't provide many details on the reason why, but later, Elon Musk clarified a bit by writing on X, quote, Too many question marks about this flight. And then, we were 20 bar lower on ground spin start pressure. Best to de-stack, inspect both stages, and try again in a day or two. 
So what he's referring to here is the pressurized gas that spins up the fuel turbo pumps on the Super Heavy Booster's Raptor engines. That pressurized gas comes from a ground system that's integrated into the launch mount. As of Tuesday, Starship remains fully stacked on the launch tower, and SpaceX has revised the launch time to Wednesday, March 5th at 5.30 p.m. U.S. Central Time. In case you missed it, Elon was just talking about Starship on the Joe Rogan podcast. There was a good news and bad news situation here. Elon made a slightly disappointing announcement that Starship's long-awaited in-flight refueling test will be postponed to next year. This would be a mission where two Starship upper stages would meet up in low Earth orbit, dock together in a back-to-back -back configuration, and then transfer cryogenic liquid propellant between the two. This was one of the big milestones that SpaceX had talked about happening in 2025, but now even Musk is seemingly not thinking that this will be possible. He kind of explains the reason why as being that full rapid reusability of the ship stage has to come first before the propellant transfer can make sense, meaning that the ship has to re-enter the atmosphere undamaged and successfully return to the launch site for a tower catch. This is something that Elon does think will happen this year. He told Joe, there is a good chance of achieving full reusability of Starship this year. But with the caveat that an immediate return to flight, as in the rocket, returns, gets caught, gets put back on the launch mount, refilled, and then relaunched. That won't be happening until at least next year as well.